The future is bright indeed. We're all of us dreaming of the better days ahead, and a part of your bright new future could be a move to where the magic lives in the greater Orlando area of Florida. One of the biggest decisions you'll make when considering a move is selecting a realtor who can successfully match you with the right home in the right location at the right price. Victor Naraki is the realtor who can help you make the move you've always wanted to. Whether you're a first-time homeowner or looking to move near Disney World, Victor is in your corner. If you are looking for an experienced real estate agent covering all of Central Florida, please visit DisneyAtYourDoorstep.com today and find out just why you should work with Victor. I encourage you to create a free, no-obligation account on his website. By doing so, you'll unlock the website's full potential and be able to enter specific criteria, save listings, and browse new properties sent to your email. Visit DisneyAtYourDoorstep.com today or visit his Facebook page, Victor Naraki Realtor. And don't forget to tell him the Grand Circle Tour podcast sent you. Theme parks here in Central Florida closed their doors today as a safety precaution. In addition to beefing up security, Disney has also closed off all of its theme parks, entertainment complexes, restaurants, and shopping venues. SeaWorld and the Holy Land Experience also shut down today, leaving thousands of tourists with little to do and nowhere to go. On September 11th, 2001, our generation's Where Were You When event happened. The terror attacks on New York, Washington, D.C., and a fourth plane that was taken by its passengers, but from all accounts was headed to the White House. A long list of establishments came to complete halt. On this detour, we're going to talk about where we were when these events happened and how they affected Walt Disney World and Disneyland. Joining me today are my two favorite co-hosts, starting off with Conductor Dan. Conductor Dan, good morning, and where were you when you first heard the news? Good morning, Stan. How are you today? Um, where was I? I was I was in New York. I live about uh, I would say about thirty miles outside, uh, thirty miles from Ground Zero. Uh, so I was pretty close, um, and I was just waking up. I was kind of in bed, getting ready for getting ready for work. I'd say, um, and that's when I got the news. And we'll get into kind of our personal stories uh, a bit later on in the in the show. Uh, also joining us is uh, Skipper Jay. Where were you when you first heard the news? Aloha. I was in bed when my mom called to let me know the second tower had been hit. Okay. And you were at that time working at Disneyland. Right. I had actually, I was a manager at the Grand Californian and I had been at work till about 2.30 the night before. So by the time I'd gotten home, got in bed, it was 3.30. By the time I'd gotten to sleep, it was 4. Uh, my mom called at 6. 615 mm -hmm. and um there, there's those couple minutes of who am i what is my name where is my coffee yeah yeah exactly. before i can process any of this giant news no kidding so you only you were only on a few mind you it must have been like about 10 10 30 uh east coast west coast time well nine o'clock you know, is six o'clock in the morning west yeah. coast time Oh, right. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Six, yeah, it was like six in the morning for you. I, I was uh, at home. It was a Tuesday, I remember. It was a Tuesday morning. And I was always watched live with Regis and Kathy Lee. So I went to turn that on. And oddly enough, the week before that, an event happened in New York that it seems like a lot of people forgot about it. A guy was parachuting and he got caught up in the Statue of Liberty. So when I first turned on the news, the first plane had hit. And my initial reaction was, what are those Americans doing now? Like, <laughs> <laughs> They're disrupting my Regis and Kathy Lee. And as I was watching it, I'm thinking to myself, like, did someone try going in between the towers and failed? Or like, was it a stunt that went wrong? Then the second plane hit. But uh, it was shocking, absolutely shocking. Uh, before we go into the events at Walt Disney World and Disneyland, I want to talk a little bit about the... It was about it was the same summer. It was the summer before going to the Canadian-U.S. border. And, Jay, you might know about this. I'm not sure or if you remember hearing about it beforehand. But there was a group of terrorists that rent, came to Canada, and they rented a van and filled it with explosives. And they were going across the border. And the Border Patrol in the U.S. actually stopped them and decided to check out the van. I'm not sure if it was a... I can't picture them having bomb-sniffing dogs back then at the border, but... They suspected something, and they checked it out, and the, the entire van was filled with explosives. Yep. And in that van was also instructions to basically blow up 
the Space Needle in Seattle, the Mall of America in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, and the Disneyland Castle in Anaheim. We had been told a different story. We had been told that it was the Disneyland Hotel itself that was the target, that they wanted to hit it as everybody was getting up for the day and heading to the park and cause a mass, cas a mass casualty event early in the morning before anyone could suspect anything. Now, did you hear about this before 9-11 happening? No, I heard about this the day of. Oh, wow. Okay. When we had gotten all pulled into two little meetings all day. Yeah. So Disneyland wasn't open yet, uh, but Walt Disney World was was already open. Magic Kingdom was filled with guests already. Yep. And uh, I'm, I'm, I listened to and read an awful lot of uh, cast member stories and guest stories. And one of the ones that was really fascinating to me was a cast member who was in the Utilidors in the staff room watching the ABC News and on the events unfolding just completely in shock and the announcer said that walt disney world just uh, all disney parks around the world announced they're closing their parks today and he's in the park and the park's open and he's <laughs> like wondering what's going on and all of a sudden everybody's beeper in the room went off saying to evacuate the park yeah i, I remember reading that story as well um you know throughout the years a lot of articles have been written and I think the truth like kind of like gets blurred a little bit. Like I've heard stories about the announcement. I've heard stories that it was actually Michael Eisner that was on the announcement. I've heard stories that they didn't mention anything about the attacks. I've heard stories that they did mention the attacks. So, you know, you don't really know exactly what's true as far as that goes. But one thing I, I will say, go ahead, Jay. I actually can tell you what was said that day. Um, I was in contact with a friend of mine who is a manager at Walt Disney World whose part of her job was to evacuate the park and, and it was due to an event we've had to close they didn't say what had happened yeah. it was just due to an event we have to close the parks please return to your hotel rooms now we have to keep in mind in 2001 cell phones were very rare yep. and smartphones were basically non-existent we had we had nokia's right <laughs> Yeah, the Nokia, Nokia's, the Nokia's, and, Nokia's and pagers, and we couldn't even do text messages back then. Right. Like we could take a picture on a phone, and that was a huge deal. Yeah, right. And very few people had them. And the ones that did have them, I guess the because they were at the parks and they were they were being told to evacuate. And basically, what they did was the cast members started at the back of the park, kind of almost joined hands, and told everybody they closed down all the attractions, they closed down all the food establishments, they closed down all the all the gift shops and told everybody had to go out to the street. Once when they got everybody out to the street, they basically told them, go back to your rooms, go back to your hotels, go back to your houses. And the guests, a lot of them did not like that. There were stories of cast members getting spit upon, being sworn at, being yelled at, saying we paid our money to be here. And they were basically handing them free comp tickets to come back as they were leaving with no questions asked. Uh, a few cast members... I, I don't know if they misunderstood the instructions and they did tell guests what happened when asked. Uh, others were followed the instructions and didn't, didn't say, but the news did. And they were afraid that it would cause panic at the magic kingdom and everybody would stampede to the exits. So, but news spread like wildfire throughout the, throughout the oh. entire guests. They figured a lot of them knew, most of them knew before they were leaving what was going on. But for the most part, the cast members were saying, just go back to your rooms, turn on your TVs. You'll, you'll, you know, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll know. So the resorts were like, this is uh, not exactly a really busy time of the sea of the year, mm -hmm. uh, especially back then, but the resorts were pretty full. And the problem is when you have everybody at the resorts, the food courts don't hold a lot of f people. They don't have a lot of food. So what Disney did was they, the food was all prepared at the parks for the day. So they were shipping it to the resorts in order to, to feed people. And people were got to their rooms. They turned on the TVs and they were glued to their TVs. They were, they never left their rooms. They, they, people that were in the park, in the resorts, were saying the resorts were like a ghost town because they were, they, they were packed, but nobody was there. Because everybody was in their rooms watching their TVs. Right. Uh, what Disney did to help out 
because like I said, nobody had cell phones was that phone calls were free, long distance phone calls were free because of course everybody's staying there wants to contact their loved ones to know what happens. People are trying to get rental cars to get back home that flew there because they obviously you can't fly home. Uh, and it was, there was no rental cars left in Orlando. I imagine it was the same in Anaheim too. We had people who were stuck with us for over a month before they could leave. Wow. Yeah. Now, were they comping those rooms for that entire month? Yeah. Because there's nothing those poor people could do about it. And it's not like they're having a good time. They were, you know, we had a duty of care at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they, they also sent a lot of the, um, the characters to the, to the parks, or sorry, to the resorts from the parks to help entertain and, and do their best to, you know, kind of preoccupy the, the, the families and the children that were there. Which I can tell you firsthand, uh, no, it was not entertaining. No? No. It was, it was not entertaining. Um, when you say ghost town, it was a ghost town of silence. I remember how quiet all the guests were, how quiet all the cast were. It was, you would make eye contact with people, but wouldn't speak. And so to have Pluto and Chippendale dancing amongst this just eerie, tense atmosphere. I mean, you guys remember how thick it was in the air. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it didn't help. It was great for little kids, but didn't help. There's a photo out there that I remember seeing about 10 years ago of, you know, from what it looked like, it was a food court of one of the hotels. And there's just what looks to be hundreds of people just sitting there watching like the one TV that they have maybe like on the, on the, you know, in the corner of the uh, ceiling. Mm -hmm. Um, And no, I mean, obviously it's a photo, but you could just tell no one was talking. Everyone's just glued to the TV. Mm -hmm you know, next to someone that they probably have no idea who this is. They've just met them. And like, you can feel the emotion just from that photo of what was going on. It was the one time where a major rule was broken and every computer screen at front desk, at concierge, at valet desk was turned to the news of some sort. We weren't running normal operations. So everybody had the news right at your waist basically mm-hmm. yeah and you would all just look down and there it was hmm. on yeah. on just tons of different screens in a row yeah now uh going back to the evacuation part of the of the park what now like dan says so many stories have been changed and, and it's the old telephone game of one person said something and the next person heard something obviously the three of us were not at walt disney world but my understanding is that the park was evacuated from all guests within a half an hour mm-hmm. from the time that they were told to start evacuating but i i also did hear that the evacuation order wasn't until around 10 o'clock meaning that the parks were evacuated by like 10 30 11 let's say yeah um, you know quick timing but was it quick enough if there was an immediate threat i'm not sure you know mm-hmm. i mean these these attacks happen pretty quick yeah now the other report that i heard was that that the uh, there was battleships off the course off the coast east coast and west coast now jay you might you might have more knowledge of this but they launched fighter jets that were circling both Magic Kingdom and Walt Disney World, basically with instructions to shoot down any passenger plane that gets too close. Uh, do you have any recollection of that, Jay? Uh, I, re- I don't remember seeing anything. Or I remember hearing about it. Yeah. And after what a that, scary thought. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was <clears throat> very intimidating to go to work and try to be responsible for all these people and be responsible to the company after hearing that, oh yeah, they were going to drop a plane on, on right next door and kill everyone you know next door. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Now, Dan, you were in New York at the time. Tell us about, uh, so you, you basically, you on a clear day, you used to be able to see the Twin Towers uh, or Ground Zero, I guess now. Yeah, I, um, 
you know, I grew up in uh, Southern Long Island, about 30 miles away from Grand Zero. And, um, you, you know, you from the park that I used to play Little League, you know, baseball at, um, you could see the Twin Towers were right in the background. Um, and it was a clear day that day, if you guys remember. It was a very, yeah. at least in New York it was, very clear day. So, um, you know, I, I, I was working at the Warner Brothers store at the time. Um, I know, not Disney. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, sorry. so... At Disney ah. Store, they call them cast members. Are they Animaniacs at the Warner Brothers Store, or what do they call? No, them? we were. Um, what were we called? We were like backstage workers. It was. It was called like the Studio Store. So we were supposed to be in like a studio. Okay, oh, okay. wait. I'm sorry to totally get off topic, but I was a Disney Store cast member, Dan. Yeah. And let's just let's settle this once and for all right here in the middle of this serious topic. <laughs> the Warner Brothers Store was better than the Disney Store. <laughs> Well, that's why I went to the Warner Brothers store. I wanted I, to I work. Really like, for it, I know? like the Warner Brothers store. Animation sells directly from the shows. Oh, yeah. That's what I used yeah. to do. I used to sell out animation yeah. sells. I went to Mall of America. The Warner Brothers store was on level one, and the Disney store was on level two, basically almost on top of each other, but across. Yeah. And I've spent way more money at the Warner Brothers store than I did at the <laughs> Disney store on those trips. Okay, go ahead, Dan. So I had the, I had the afternoon shift. Um, and I got a phone call from my mother and, and, you know, at the time we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know if it was missiles. We didn't necessarily know it was planes right away. I think this was even before the second uh, tower was hit. Um, so I remember my mom clearly saying like, they're bombing us, like get out of the house. Right. And where are you going to go? I, I, I don't know. People no leaving the city. People, like, uh, well, you couldn't really leave the city. Everyone was, but there's, I mean, I have, plenty of friends you know 24 years old most of my friends were just starting to work and just starting to commute into the city most people that work on long island work in the city right that live on long island work in the city um so i you know i i've seen many pictures through my life of people walking over the bridges you know and took them days to get home yeah. um and again there was no cell phones back then and the ones that did work there were no circuits so you couldn't t- you couldn't talk to anyone you didn't know what was mm-hmm. going on and um you know, I remember, I remember, you know, I say the story is a joke, but my intent wasn't funny. I, I grabbed a baseball bat. I don't know why, but I grabbed a bat and I just ran outside. The first thing I thought to do was run to that park. And I remember standing in, the, in that field with probably about 20 other people just staring at the smoke with a, with a baseball bat in my hand. Like I was going to do something about it, you know, <laughs> in like, the baseball field. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, we we talked about the the Warner Brothers store. Um, our sister store. I was in one of the malls on Long Island. Our sister store was in one of the World Trade Centers. So my immediate thought, and 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 one of my co managers had gotten married uh, like a couple months before that, and they covered for us, so we got to know them really well. So my immediate thought was was that you know for their safety. Now, thank God, every single one of them were okay, and they all got out very quickly. Um, but the hardest part in New York, and it's still, it still goes on to this day, you know, but the hardest part in the beginning was the days later, because there was no communication like this Mm. lasted days for us, you know, weeks. It's listen, it's lasted years. It's lasted 20 years of what we've gone through, but you, you just hear stories, you know, you wake up in the morning saying, who am I going to find out about today that passed away? And. I talked to my mom and she's like, oh, you know, remember the guy that used to live in the blue house, like two, two blocks away. Never met the guy, but yeah, he was in one of the, one of the world trade centers. So he's wow. gone, you know, and I still, I still hear people like that. You know, I was at a concert a couple of weeks ago and, and there was a guy tailgating next to me and um, he was a little, like you could tell he was a little sick and, and I just started talking to him and he just opened up about how sick he got from working at ground zero afterwards. And, He's still living with the, with the lung damage that he has, you know. And I mean, this was this was a week ago. I was having this conversation. So we're talking about twenty years later, and New York is still really trying to recover. One of my best friends, um, you know, his brother-in-law died in the accident. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. I it, exactly. Uh, it, and a lot of things changed right after Jay. You, you had something. I was to say I was twenty five. Dan was twenty four. Stan, how old were you? Uh, you know, I'm not sure, but I had two kids at the time. I had two girls. Uh, I was home alone with them. 
I can't remember how old I was 20 years ago. I can't remember how old I am today. <laughs> this is this is um it's been with us our entire adult lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because I don't know about you guys, but for me, it feels like I've lived half a dozen lifetimes between then and now. And I didn't have any of what Dan had to go through. Um, I didn't know anybody in New York. I, I only had to worry about my family and friends. I, I, I cannot begin to imagine what it was like for someone like Dan. Yeah. To watch it in real time and to know people there. I had the luxury of being on the other edge of the country. We didn't have to go through the pain that you guys did and still do. I, uh, uh, just today I was listening to some people telling the stories and there was truck drivers that were would do long transports from Canada to the US and what would normally would take a 15 minute procedure to get across the border took three days with because they were emptying every single tr truck and every single trailer it was a 15 mile mm -hmm. wait to get across the border in, in some parts of the country they there is there is a world before 9-11 and a world after 9-11 and i feel bad for kids today because we got to see the world honestly when it was still a lot more fun yeah, let's talk a little bit about some of the changes that happened uh, since 9-11. Uh, before the events of 9-11, uh, people were able to walk right into the parks. Basically, there was no security checkpoints. Starting uh, September 12th, the very next day when the parks reopened, they had the uh, tables set up and they were going through people's uh, backpacks and, and bags and purses. And to this day, that's still still the case. Uh, it was it was a pretty quick how pretty amazing how quickly Disney was able to get that set up and going. It was overnight, literally. Um, it was a lot of decisions made very quickly the day of, and yeah. I remember how weird it was the first time going through the gates and being frisked. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It put a, a very real stamp on things because. It always just walked in, walked up, no problem. Now, to be treated as a, a potential security threat before you went into the happiest place on earth, really night and day. I can't describe how weird it was Yeah. in the moment. Uh, another big change was people didn't travel. And they didn't go on vacations, uh, especially long distance or or especially across the world to the U.S. And the travel industry and, and Disney World took a huge hit because of this. All right. How many hotels closed and didn't reopen for months, years? Yeah. And like we look at even the expansions to the parks and to the uh, resorts that Disney World was planning at the time. Uh, Epcot was actually, to uh, Future World, they had plans to do a complete rehaul and, and complete... Um, you know, rejuvenate all of Future World, and that was completely put on hold. Right, that was a massive overhaul. I mean, it included things like ripping out the interior of Spaceship Earth and putting in a roller coaster. Sounds very familiar to today. <laughs> Twenty years later, it's finally coming. Twenty through. years later, they finally get around to it. And hey, <laughs> and guess what happens? We shut the parks down again. But it cost Disney World River Country. Yep. I mean, the real reason River Country closed was because of 9 11. I mean, tourism took such a hit. Um, once we got those people out of the hotels, they didn't come back forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I remember, I remember not going on a vacation for like years later. You yeah. Know? Like maybe, maybe somewhere close, but actually getting on a plane, it took, it was years before I went on well, a plane again. And then not just go getting on a plane, but going to the airport, and now your shoes have to come off, your yeah. bags. Have. I remember the day mm -hmm. when you could just go to the airport, swipe your credit card, get in a machine, get on a plane, lickety split, no problem. And now all of a sudden, it was like entering a war zone 
to get on a plane. And then do you remember how suspicious you were those first couple of flights looking at people? Looking at everyone. Yeah. It's funny how 20 years later, though, that that is the norm, right? And, like, my son knows no other way, and he's so efficient when he goes to the airports, like, waiting in that line. He knows mm-hmm. to take his shoes off. He knows to get everything ready to go. And, you know, that's just that's just what he – that's just how it is for him, you know? I think we've all gotten more efficient. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we get annoyed at the people in front of us that don't aren't. fly enough. That aren't. <laughs> uh, Chester and Hester's – uh, was a result in Dino Land and Animal Kingdom was a result of 9 11. Uh, originally, they were going to have the Beast of the Kingdom, and it was a much more extensive expansion. And when people stopped going, Disney had to start saving money. And they got cardboard cutouts, for lack of a better term, and off the shelf attractions. Oh, Disneyland hemorrhaged money for years because. Right before 9-11, we had opened up a theme park that was terrible and literally every single person hated. And word of mouth was, don't go to this awful park. Spend $50 on a ticket, you're going to waste your money. Mm-hmm. And so in addition to people not wanting to travel, oh, we definitely don't want to go there. Not only is it a possible target, they did something really cheap and it's not worth the money. Are you talking about California Adventure? Or- yeah. yeah, California Adventure 1.0. Yeah. yeah. I, it was kind of a a repulsor magnet. It just kept people away on yeah. top of that. Uh, I think something that came, like I wouldn't say good out of 9-11, but it's something that like, I think is better because of 9-11 was the expansion to Pop Century. Pop Century was a fairly brand new resort. It was like a new expansion to the value resorts. And... The extent, initial extension, which is now Art of Animation, was supposed mm-hmm. to be kind of a mirror image of Pop Century. And I think what they came up with years later, because they put that on hold, it was basically... Well, it was going to be the legendary years. It was going to be yeah. the zeros yeah. to the to and, 40s. And you can go online and, and find those pictures of the buildings that were built, like yeah. identical buildings, but and they, they stayed s- there empty. Yeah, yeah, they sat there. They looked abandoned right on the other side of, of the open yeah. hotel. Well, I've, I've been at Pop Century and looked across the river and wondered what is that over there and it's these empty buildings with no windows and tall grass (laughs) and it's weird to see that on disney property yeah yeah and i think what we ended up with with art of animation is far more superior than i what kid doesn't want to go sleep in the 30s section (laughs) i I, I, hey as a kid i always wanted to sleep spend a night in hooverville in the 30s Uh, Lilo and Stitch came out shortly after 9-11 and had to be completely changed. The end. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, the original plan was the final scene where they, they're flying through the mountains. Was it, was it New York City itself? Mm-hmm. Well, no, it was, it was Honolulu, but right. they were going to be destroying buildings in Honolulu as, as they escaped. Right. Yeah. Uh, so they had to completely reanimate the backgrounds. Mm-hmm. For, for that, there was also some uh, Jungle Cruise jokes that mm-hmm. uh, yeah. were about plane crashes that they immediately dropped from the script. And I heard that at some skippers would kind of talk about something else other than the plane crash and how they got it was a crash landing. That's how they got there, or there was a crash yeah. course that they took. Uh, and others just did a moment of silence. Yep. While, while really going yeah. by the plane crash. Yeah. What other things uh, kind of were, were changed or, or are now different? Do you guys remember seeing the trailer for the first Spider-Man movie? Yes, I was going to talk and about that. And the, the helicopter between the, tw- the Twin Towers mm-hmm. and just how exciting that visual was. Yep. Yeah. Where, where Spider-Man basically makes a giant web between the Twin Towers. Yeah. That, was, that was the Tobey Maguire version, right? The yeah, it was yeah. the very first one, yeah. Yeah, and, the, and then the helicopter ends up getting caught in... in right. Spider-Man's web. And here, we are 20, and here we are 20 years later excited about Tobey Maguire being Spider-Man again, right? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, what was the... There was an nothing's, attraction. nothing's changed. We're just older and heavier. <laughs> <laughs> there was an attraction in Future World with... Oh, I had it written. With Tomorrow. Uh, it was that you could do time travel 
all around the world. And they had to change that because it's, it was a circle vision uh, theater movie type thing in, in Tomorrowland. And they had to change it because at one point you actually go to the Twin Towers in modern Are you talking day. about Timekeeper? Timekeeper. Okay. Yes. Timekeeper had to be completely changed mm -hmm. uh, after that because there was a time a Twin Towers scene in that attraction. Yeah. True. Yeah. This was the only, at the time, it was only the second time that Walt Disney World had to have been closed. And it was the third time, unplanned closure. Mm -hmm. And the third time for Disneyland. Now, Disneyland kind of got a little bit easier where they just basically didn't open because, it, because of the time zones. But for Walt Disney World, for those cast members, this was kind of like their first ever real world experience having to evacuate the park. And it's it, it kind of a moment in history uh, that's that's. And you have to imagine what a logistical nightmare that is right after opening, because it's like a water balloon breaking and you have to go and get all those drops back in into the, the balloon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because they, they once it's once it opens, they have spread into every little location. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they've evacuated a park since. Did they extent. have they evacuated for a hurricane or they've just closed? They just don't open. Okay. Yeah, they just don't open it. Jay, will you um do you I don't know if you remember this, but were you scheduled to work the next day at all? Um I was scheduled to work that day uh to come in at three. And so I stayed home and kind of was watching TV and calling them and filling them in what was happening throughout the day and just keeping in touch. And I was told, bring a bag, you're staying the night. And my shift was scheduled to start at three. So I came in at two and I just remember how eerie it was to be it, it, it the night before we had just been slammed. And here, all you could hear that's this night was the sound of birds, hmm. and how odd that was. I remember the weirdest part of the day was by eleven thirty. I obviously no one's coming in. We've shut the doors. I've got up to my room, taken my shoes off, turned on the news, and I didn't realize it had become September twelfth. And there was something about the news announcer saying yesterday's attacks. Hmm. And that that feeling of having moved through history, just such a yeah. weird feeling. I can still remember twenty years later that what we have just been through is now forever part of our history. Yeah, it's funny yeah. how those little things, right? I think everyone has those things. You know, it's yeah, something so small that like sticks with you for so long. You know, for me. It was the smell of the air, you know. I, I still like. I've never smelt that smell again, but like I, I still have it. You know, like it's a weird thing that I could still smell it. Is it like ash or burning or? Mm, I, it's it's something I've never smelt before. I I, I don't even know. I, I don't know. It was if it was burning metal, or jet fuel, or whatever it was in the air. But it was it was just there for days, maybe weeks. I don't even remember. Hmm. And like every once in a while, where I'm when I'm outside. Like that weird smell just pops up in my head, mm -hmm. you know. I know is I'm it, not actually smelling it, but yeah, yeah. The, the 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 smell is the memory. Yeah, exactly. My um, district manager at the time, the company I work for, it, it was an American company. It has now since been purchased by a Canadian company, but at the time it was an American company. So our head office was in Pleasanton, California, and during 9/11, uh, my district manager. And all the district managers in North America were in California, in Pleasanton. So his first time hearing about, he got up, got ready. They were having a, like a general meeting and it was in a theater with a large screen. His first time seeing the events of 9-11 was on a large screen. He didn't wow. even know about. And they showed, they started the meeting by showing that and basically said the meeting's canceled. Everybody go home. Well, that. For if you're in the U.S., you can rent a car or whatever and drive home. If you're in Canada, it's a little bit different. So all the district managers from across Canada rented one big van, and their plan was to drive to Vancouver and then from Vancouver try to figure out a way to get back to their home provinces. 
So they were driving down the highway or the freeway with this van and the van broke down and they had to pull over to the side. And a state trooper pulled up behind them and they explained what was going on. And the state trooper actually waved down a large bus, like a passenger bus type of thing, a chartered bus. And he said to the bus driver, he says, you're taking these Canadians as far north as you can and so they can get to a city or, or to the next city so they can rent another van so they can get back to Canada. Wow. And the bus driver said, no, I'm not. This is a chartered bus. I'm, it's not my, my job. I'm not doing that. So he took off his sunglasses, put his hand on his pistol and said, this country is going to hell in a handbasket. And you're taking these Canadians as far north until they can rent another van to get back wow. to Canada. <laughs> so he said, hop on board, guys. Wow. <laughs> so, you, they, uh, so they only really, thing that would make that story better is if he looked over his aviator glasses and gone, you will respect my authority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was yeah. very big at the time. Yeah, pretty much. So he basically told him, I'll take care of the rental car. Uh, you guys don't worry about it. He says, just you know, get back to your country and and god bless basically was was his message to them in a uh, weird way i kind of miss that i miss the camaraderie that we all had immediately yeah. after especially in new york i'm sure it was all over the country but the yeah. amount of love that we were given i mean i i remember feeling a great sense of pride for my country for for my neighbors for everything and uh in a weird way, I miss that, you know, because we don't really have that right now. In the world. We have not felt that since I would say that first initial week or two, that total unification of everyone across the country, which never happens. And I knew it was going to last a short time, and it did. And yeah, we have not lasted, seen it since. I think it lasted longer than you think. I mean, like, I'm, I'm speaking from a person from outside of the U.S., yeah. but I could feel the patriotism that the Americans had that they didn't have prior and yeah. it lasted for quite some time, but yeah. you're right. It has really weaned and it's probably worse now than it's ever been. Yeah. yeah. It, it's really, it was a nice feeling, but it, it's, we haven't felt anything like that since then. And, and I think a big part of it was the president basically telling everybody yeah. to reopen. No, pol no politics. Just the politics. politics. <laughs> politics basically everybody was told to reopen and this isn't going to bring us down. We are going to be stronger than ever because of this. Yeah. And as early as the 24th, the flags were no longer at half staff. Right. Well, the president even said, go back to Disney world. Yep. He said, those mm -hmm. things. I'll tell you guys, like just from a personal perspective, you know, there was a lot of anger. Like anger is yeah. the, the most the, is the strongest emotion that I felt personally. I was a twenty four year old cocky kid, and you know that's what it was. Now, getting off topic a little, I don't know if you guys remember this, but I'm I'm a huge Mets fan, right? Even though they hate me right now, um, but you know we had they had that first game, and no one knew if it was if we should have done it or not, you know, and. You know, Mike Piazza was my favorite player. And I don't know if you guys remember this, but what happens is that Mike Piazza hits a home run in the bottom of the eighth inning to win the game. And it was that exact moment where I felt like it was okay to like cheer again. And I was at a bar. It was the first time I went back to a bar, you know, since then. And I just remember like the place erupted and everyone's chanting USA and we're hugging and crying and like, you know, something like that. Like it was important for us to get out there and do things again. Yeah, yeah. But what you say about the anger, Dan? I think that is really the depressing part. Is because the anger was there. It was right underneath all the unity and what grew and why we are where we are today. No politics. No politics. Is rather than ride that unity wave, we let the hate take over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what about you, listeners? Do you remember? Wait, wait I have Go one. I, I will. I have one story. Um, and I really think this needs to become a film. There is one 9-11 story that hasn't been told. And just to end this on a bit of a lighter note, um, do you guys know that Liza Minnelli, Marlon Brando, and Michael Jackson couldn't fly home on 9-11? So they rented a car 
and drove cross country to get home to California. Hmm. And this story of Marlon Brando, Liza Minnelli, and Michael Jackson on a cross country trip right after 9 11. Someone please make this film. Wow. <laughs> That'd yeah, be great. Right? Okay, Can you imagine? I just, I just, I just want to see them at the drive-through. Yeah. <laughs> at the gas station. Right. <laughs> Pumping the gas. Who's, who's, who's the one that actually fills the tank? At, at some point in the movie, they have to run into a uh, broken-down van full of Canadian uh, executives. <laughs> <laughs> and Roscoe P. Train <laughs> is the sheriff. <laughs> but somebody needs to make this true life story into a film, please. <laughs> Okay, Ken, take it away. If you would like to keep the adventure going after the show, be sure to like our Facebook friends page, Grand Circle Tours Magical Ticket Holders. While you're on Facebook, like our group page, Grand Circle Tours. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, Grand Circle Tours Podcast, as well as on Instagram, GCT Podcast, and our YouTube channel, Grand Circle Tour. If you would like to email us, drop us a line at gctpodcast at gmail.com. T-shirts and other fun merchandise can be found at tpublic.com. Simply search Grand Circle Tour Podcast. If you enjoyed your adventure, leave us a review on Apple Podcast. Only one rule, make it good. All logos, sounds, songs, and music that are made by and for Disney and its affiliates are the full ownership of the Disney Corporation and are not, nor are they intended to be, the ownership of the Grand Circle Tour podcast. Thank you for riding with us, and welcome home.